<laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Shadia Rafe, I'm a board certified surgeon. And um, right off the bat for this particular talk, it's not one that is uh, common at all. Um, even myself, you know, uh, very few, very few of the procedures here that I'll talk about I've actually performed. It's not a common scenario. The goal of the talk is exposure. Just to kind of show you some of the things that are out there that you could consider um, or at least talk to a client about before referral to a, to a board of surgeons. So um, a lot of this will be sort of academic and maybe fairly quick. I, did, I do have proceedings, notes that'll, that are very, very detailed. They'll, they'll be up available for you guys at some point. So um, if you want to learn more about the specifics of this stuff, you know, you're welcome to. But just to make that clear, this is going to be kind of a weird, sort of a, a unconventional topic. Um, but my background, I graduated from Cornell in 06 and then did a one-year internship at Angel in Boston. After that, two surgery internships and a surgery residency at Long Island Veterinary Specialist. Became boarded, then moved out to Las Vegas uh, from New York. Spent about nine months at the specialty hospital there, then ran three hospitals in Silicon Valley. After that, um, expanded a, a hospital in LA to 24-7 multi-specialty ER from overnights and weekends to, to uh, seven days a week. And then uh, now I, I operate uh, vet triage uh, pretty much full time. Um, in this talk, we'll review some pancreatic anatomy and function. A lot of the talk will be based on this and just more of an academic reminder. Those of you in practice for a while, these things tend to be, you know, just, just don't, don't apply them much anymore. Um, but it's, it's good to have an understanding of these aspects. And then we'll talk about cancers, pancreatic abscess, and then a host of, of, of pancreatic biopsies that we can, we can talk about. Um, at any point, if you have any questions or want to have an opinion or anything, just let me know. Feel free to jump, jump in. Um, so pretty rudimentary stuff here, but just, just to go over some basic anatomy here, the uh, left limb of the pancreas uh, sits here by the stomach within, within the uh, leaves of the momentum, and then the right limb of the pancreas within the mesoduodenum on the medial side of the descending duodenum. Um, the um, variations of, between dogs and cats for the pancreatic ducts is obviously this plays a, a role, especially in cats with you know, triaditis. But um, uh, in general, there's always exceptions, obviously. In general, the pancreatic duct in cats is the main, the main duct for them, and it usually will um, either insert at the, at the duodenal papilla and the duodenum right at the junction, or, or they'll, they'll converge just prior to reaching the papilla. Dogs have a lot more variation. They've got two pancreatic ducts. The, more, the minor one for them is the pancreatic duct. Whereas in the cats, that's, that's their only, that's their major one. And in dogs, they have the accessory pancreatic duct, and that, I think like 80% of dogs, that's the big one. That's their more, more uh, important duct out of the two. But the same goes with the joining of the papilla. So they will also, here, so, so they will, they'll also either join right at the major duodenal papilla um, at the junction, or they'll join before entering the papilla. And then, and then the accessory pancreatic duct um, uh, empties through the minor duodenal uh, papilla. So that's, that's variation there. And again, in dogs, you have all different kinds of, you know, they're, they, maybe they're miss, missing one or the other, or, um, or maybe um, uh, they are joining um, uh, within the actual pancreas, and, the, and then the two ducts combine in the pancreas and then come out as one duct and, and will either insert at the major or the minor. It just it depends, there's always variation there. At the end of the day, probably surgically speaking, it may not, make too big of a difference really because most of the time when you're, when you're doing abdominal exploratories on pancreatic cases it's a mess in there and you know and so so you don't really dis distinguish between these things but it's interesting to know that there's differences in anatomy where it does come into play is if you're a really good ultrasonographer and you can you can differentiate yeah the, the uh, these these tiny objects you need to know the the variation in anatomy so just to reiterate ooh, just to reiterate the location of the of the pancreas um, again, the left limb within the uh, leads the momentum, right limb by the duodenum. And if you have a, a dog on, on the dorsal recumbency, head is, head is uh, uh, here, their um, tail's over here, obviously, and then the pancreas is seated uh, deep into the abdomen. Again, usually if you're dealing with normal pancreas, then you've got to 
if you're looking for the left limb, you're going to go through the leaves of the omentum to access the left limb. If you're looking for right limb of the pancreas, you're going to retract the, the duodenum medially to then expose it in the mesial duodenum. But, but more often, you're dealing with a, with a nightmare of a mess of the pancreas, and it's just it's right there when you, when you open the abdomen, and it's, it's, there's ascites and old scar tissue and everything with, with that. So the, the, the anatomy will never be really this clear if you're actually chasing severe pancreatic disease. But if you're trying to collect the pancreatic biopsy, which we do very often, then, uh, then uh, you're, you have to do a little bit of, of searching to, to see the, uh, the pancreatic limbs. The um, pancreatic anatomy uh, on a histo level, <clears throat> there's, you divide the pancreas into exocrine and endocrine functions. And, and of course, histologically, that's, that's how they're, they're designed. So, um, and again, bear with me, I'm not a histologist, and this is not the best looking image. Uh, in, the, in the lighting in the room, but the Z here is for a zymogen, and so what, what you're what you're maybe can notice is a whole bunch of tiny pink dots in these in these cells, and the zymogen holds the zymogen granules holds the enzymes that will then be cleaved to become activated to help with digestion. That's the point, and so this is the the exocrine pancreatic uh, function, and uh, and that's what's going to lead to the to the pancreatic ducts to help with digestion from the uh, cranial duodenum. And then the other portion of the pancreas is going to be the endocrine portion um, here. And um, boy, and then it's so tough to say on, on here. Oh, these guys here, well, now the zymogen granules. And so the idea here with, with the endocrine portion is they're going to produce hormones that are going to be released in an endocrine fashion, so into the bloodstream to then have effects in the, in the body. And uh, that's a lot of where this talk will go is, is based on the, the endocrine portion of the, the pancreas. Again, you'll, you're probably not performing histopath in the, uh, in the clinic, but just to be aware that that's how we divide the pancreas. So when you look at the, at the endocrine function, um, these are the four major hormones that we're talking about. And obviously insulin is, is the, the most common one, but the, uh, the alpha cells that make up these patches of endocrine, endocrine functionality for the pancreas, release glucagon, and glucagon green means that it's promoting it, so it's trying to increase glucose values in the, in the bloodstream. So it promotes glucose, promotes glycogen breakdown, it promotes making new glucose, that's the idea behind glucagon. Whereas the, the beta cells that release insulin in the pancreas, their job is to decrease glucose levels in the bloodstream, so it'll, they'll, they'll mobilize glucose into the cells, they are promoting um, uh, a formation of glycogen, they are promoting um, uh, fat production as well, and then gluconeogenesis and protein as well. I, I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about protein and, and uh, lipids with this, but just know that insulin has a function with those. Delta cells release some somatostatin, and they not only have effects on, on uh, glucagon and insulin, but also it affects the gallbladder and small intestinal motility, and pancreatic polypeptide has uh, mixed, mixed effects on gallbladder and small intestine. And this is just an, a, a, a simple picture breakdown of the, of the same the same thing. The insulin, of course, is the is our focus most commonly. Then with exocrine function, all of these different uh, parameters are affected by the exocrine portion of the pancreas. It's very very important, obviously very vital for keeping homeostasis and helping with digestion. The big one, of course, is going to be auto digestion protection. So the reason why pancreatitis gets out of control so quickly is because once you've reached a point to where auto digestion is no longer protected by the pancreas itself, now you have this positive feedback loop where just now it's in self destruction mode. And so, if you look at a, at a schematic view of this, these are your zymogen granules, right, with all the enzymes, and they're being released to the to the uh, uh, out of the cells into the, uh, the the ducts and. When all these measures fail to try and protect the pancreas from basically auto-digesting, um, you end up with, with pancreatitis, and it's, it creates this, 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 uh, this positive feedback loop. So um, very important functionality there, and your notes have way more detail about this if you want to learn more about it from an academic standpoint. So when you look at um, neoplasia, endocrineoplasia, again, super, super uncommon. Um, have folks here seen insulinomas in, in their practice? Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so insulinomas are the, are the most common one that we see, and even they are uncommon in the, in the larger scheme of things. And you can have tumors that release single or multiple hormones. These are just three, there's, there's, there's others. 
and so that's anyway. And, and and you know your standard insulinoma never looks like this. It's always some tiny in, inconspicuous nodule on the pancreas that you can barely know, that you barely see. But uh, this is just to show you that. That's all. Um, so insulinoma will be the one that we're going to focus on here in terms of endocrineoplasty disease for the pancreas. They are insulin secreting beta cell tumors. The insulinomas either can be adenomas or adenocarcinomas. They can release insulin or pro-insulin, which is the precursor to insulin. Now, when you're trying to diagnose these, which can be very, very challenging for these dogs, your history and clinical science, which we're gonna go over, are, are your first starting point to think, oh, maybe this is an insulinoma, you know? But you also wanna uh, diagnose it objectively. So, in a normal body, you, don't, you never have a scenario where the body accidentally releases too much insulin or overcorrects for hypoglycemia. It doesn't happen. They, they, in a normal body, they should be proportional. So the glucose level should match whatever the insulin concentration is going to be. You shouldn't have a scenario where a dog has high insulin and low glucose. That's not the body compensating for something. That's abnormal. That, that just shouldn't be. Um, it's just like anything else. Calcium me measurements are that way as well, right? It's, it's kept in a, in a tight, tight um, uh, concentration to promote health. So just when you interpret these, acid base, for example, is a, a common one. If you look at acid uh, blood gases too, same thing. You, don't, you never get an overcompensation of something. If it doesn't match up, then something is wrong with the body. Whipple's triad is the three um, um, hallmarks of insulinomas. So it comprises of having clinical signs during either fasting or exercise. These are, these are both times where glucose in exercise, glucose is being used. Fasting, you're not, you don't have enough glucose, and there are clinical signs associated with that. The second uh, caveat is that you have um, clinical signs in the face of hypoglycemia. So you, you document hypoglycemia, and they have the clinical signs present. And then third, those clinical signs resolve if you give them glucose. Those, that's Whipple's triad, and that's, that's sort of the, 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 the parameters that you're using to try and diagnose insulinoma. Older dogs, um, medium to large breed, mixed breed, make up 22%, we see in cats as well. 13 and a half years old, Siamese, Persians. The clinical signs, as you're well aware of, um, and there are many, many clinical signs, they're just the most common ones, seizures, collapse and fatigue and weakness. The point of, of listing these is to also differentiate the categories of clinical signs. So there's two different categories of clinical signs with insulinoma. One relates to the hypoglycemic aspect to it. So you end up getting what they call it a, a neuroglycopenia, where the nervous system now is being affected by having hypoglycemia. The nervous system relies heavily on glucose. That's its main energy source. And so, so signs of seizures, collapse, fatigue, and weakness have to do with hypoglycemia affecting the nervous system. The secondary category of clinical signs have to do with the uh, stress response catecholamines, cortisol, and those are the dogs that have restlessness, they are salivating, pacing, they seem anxious. That's the stress response to hypoglycemia. So two broad categories. The more common though are these neurologic things that we end up seeing. Mean blood glucose levels in these dogs is 46 mg per DL. And you know, if this is the combination of low glucose, high insulin, that's not normal. And so there's your, there's your insulinoma. Of course, we would like to see the insulinoma too, because you know you're considering, okay, well, is this something that we can surgically treat? And um, again, they tend to be tiny, and so uh, if you have a really good ultrasonographer, then um, or if you have computer tomography, if you have a CT scan, then you can try and find the, the, the tumor. But ultrasound, you're looking for a cervical or lobular hypochoic lesion. You'll see it in you know 22 to 69 percent of cases. Zomal CT, uh, increased accuracy compared to ultrasound. And then um, uh, when you're preparing these dogs for further evaluation, especially in a facility like, like ours where it's 24 seven, so we have all that monitoring there, they're gonna be on, on, on a CRI, and you wanna keep the dextrose levels enough to where you're maintaining a glucose that's over 40 mg per DL. Now, most of the clinical signs we see with these dogs is not necessarily how bad the glucose is, it's, it's, it's always the, 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 the rapid change in glucose. So, so they go from normal to all of a sudden hypoglycemic. You have plenty of cases that are chronically hypoglycemic. They're walking around with low glucose levels and they may not show you that sudden onset of a Whipple's triad that we, that we talked about before but it's the rate of glucose decline that it makes these dogs really clinical for the condition. So in the same way that rate influences their clinical signs, you don't necessarily want to blast them with glucose, you want to keep them at a level that's, that's higher than what they came in with, basically. So we don't, I don't really have a ceiling here, 
but you're not aiming for 180, you just want something over 40. You're trying to maintain them where their clinical signs are kept at bay in preparation for, for surgery. Or if you're medically managing them, yes? Do you ever see the post surgical hyperglycemia? Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so the question is, do you ever see post-op post hyperglycemia? Um, ab absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And um, um, I've never had it, um, but, but it, it has been reported where you may need uh, insulin supplementation transiently until they're more stable, so yeah. So I, I would probably uh, say, you know, the reason why I probably have not seen too many as a surgeon is because I think a lot of them are either, either not being diagnosed or probably they're being medically managed because people aren't pursuing surgery. The outcome is not great for these dogs. Just diagnosing it can be, can be very difficult. And then a surgical explore doesn't guarantee success either. So I think I, as a surgeon, I don't end up uh, with the privilege of, of managing these cases because they end up getting medical management anyway. But with medical management al um, alone, survival, you know, barely, uh, in what, two months? Um, the, <laughs> with the nucleation, so basically just removing the tumor itself from the pancreas, assuming you can locate it, uh, about a year survival. And then when you, when you get a bit more aggressive, partial pancre pancreatectomy, median survival of uh, one to two years, and then you're maintaining normal glucose for about 14 months with these dogs. So they, they, they do differentiate success with this, with this procedure is uh, of uh, how long have they survive, but until that point, how long does glucose maintain? Because you may have a patient that has recurrent hypoglycemia that you're now manage, managing medically after they've had surgery a year ago or something like that. And then of course, subtotal pancreatectomy, uh, I, I'm not sure who, who's, who's doing this uh, for, for this disease. Um, if you stage these dogs, so if you're collecting a, a local, a regional lymph node biopsy um, and or a liver biopsy, which in the, in the few that I have done, I've at least, I always biopsy liver. Lymph node is only if it's identifiable, otherwise I'm, I'm not going to search that, that much for the lymph node. But if they are uh, positive for lymph nodes, then your survival is 547 days. If it's in the liver, 217 days. So the, if you're positive in the lymph node, that's, that's stage two, and then liver involvement is stage three. So if you look at survival based on stage, um, stage one, which is only confined to the pancreas, plus, um, uh, uh, or, or stage two, which is uh, pancreas and lymph node, median survival, maybe about a year. Uh, stage three, where it's in, in the uh, liver as well, survival, less than six months. And then if you look at the um, uh, normal glucose parameters, stage one, about a year for normal glucose, and one month for two and three. So it's, it's pretty, pretty crappy overall for these. Um, there, there, are, there are some papers that talk about, you know, what do you do if you can't find it? So you're convinced it's there, right? It may be seen on ultrasound, the blubber confirms it, clinical signs confirm it. You go into surgery and you don't, you, the surgeon can't find it. And there's like methylene blue and there's other, there's other things. I've, I've never done these things because it, I've been fortunate in the few that I've seen, I, I, it's there. But some advocate like just removing random portions of the pancreas. Which, yeah, which, you know, you wouldn't. Um, the distribution is almost like perfect across the board, like the left limb, right limb, and middle of the pancreas. They're all sort of equal proportion to where you find insulinoma anyway. So um, it's just a dumb concept, I think, you know? It's just not worth it. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say it because it's in the literature, but uh, I'm not sure I, I, would, I would do that. So postoperatively, uh, hypoglycemia, 15 to 26% of patients will have it, and then persistently, 33% of patients. So the solution for this, typically steroids, trying to get the glucose up. You know, uh, we know that glu glu glucocorticoids are diabetogenic. They're going to be trying to increase glu glucose. So, um, you know, whatever you want, this is, the, this is the parameter that I found in the literature. Again, typically at this point, the surgeon, I'm turfing them over to medicine. Internal medicine is going to take care of these from there. And so the idea is to have the same effects that I mentioned earlier. Um, Thiase oxide is, um, has been used as well. Um, you know, there's, there's your efficacy there and overall prognosis is pretty poor. These are a bunch of different parameters that are also gonna be in your, in your notes. But um, how you treat them, so obviously, you know, the more aggressive you can be with them, then probably the better, because you can at least identify the tumor and then maybe get margins on it. Um, disease stage, as we discussed, affects them. Stage three, worse than stage one. Patient age. Um, is, is a problem as well. Um, you know, the, the literature will, will, will quote dogs that are like, like three, four years old. I mean, I've only seen them in like middle in, and middle age and above, so I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, patient, patient age plays a role. Um, uh, how bad is their uh, insulin pre-op? 
what is a glucose post op? These things all affect the recovery. But really, at the end of the day, um, you know, if you have suspicion of this, this is enough information to talk to an owner about what, what do you want to do next because this is, is going to be a tough call. So that's uh, insulinomas. Um, the rest of the endocrine tumors are in the notes. They're just so uncommon. So exocrine pancreatic neoplasia, these are always a disaster. <laughs> it's the theme of this talk. So you're looking at either carcinomas or adenocarcinomas as far as malignant versions versus an adenoma. The ductal cell type is more common. And um, usually these are, these are uh, uh, carcinomas and adenocarcinomas almost 80%. Here are the other cell types as well. Males more than females, and there are always older dogs and cats that have these. Uh, ultrasound, you're gonna look, you're gonna find a mass. And again, in my experience, it's always just some. Uh, it's always differentiating between severe pancreatitis versus a mass. It's hard, hard to say. Um, CT also helps with with these cases as well. But then in the day, you end up seeing this just multi multi nodular large mass, usually with uh, peripancreatic um, uh, fluid buildup, some level of peritonitis suspected. They're they're always they're always a mess. So those, but these are the findings of ultrasound. You may or may not see uh, evidence of suspected hepatic metastatic disease. So 20 to 100 percent of cases, like it's all over the place. You know, um, if you want to have ultrasound guided aspirates, um, uh, it'll show up positive on histopath in 50 to 92 percent of cases. It's like it's just it's just so non-specific. So specifically, you're looking at the of the pet. Uh, owners want to go forward, you're looking at abdominal exploratory, try and see if you can either debulk this thing or at least biopsy so you can tell them is it a pancreatic abscess, is it like a weird like pseudocyst, or is it cancer? And even with that, it's tough to say because you're dealing with this massive ball of pancreas that's sort of adhered to everything and a surgeon could easily biopsy an area that becomes, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the diagnostic area. It'll probably come back pancreatitis, sure, but I mean, you could have neoplasia causing secondary pancreatitis. So it, it's, it's tough with these cases uh, on, on exploratory. Um, most of the time you're seeing diffuse disease, and sometimes you'll see it focally on one of the limbs. The um, COX-2 expression on histopathology is interesting because, because then what, I, what, I, what I've been doing with these cases, if I diagnose or suspect um, exocrine pancreatic neoplasia, I will put them on COX-2 inhibitors and see if that does anything, and, and the oncologist will as well. So it's just it's it's good to see things like that because it gives you another avenue to try for pet owners if they're not going to go with surgery, or if you do go with surgery but it's, it's not resectable, um, and and these things tend to be pretty chemo resistant. So so it's nice to see at least there's some sort of option there, but you know it's not that common either. <laughs> Metastatic disease, seventy-seven percent. Stage one, thirty-three percent. Stage two and three each about seventeen percent. These are all just incidences. Um, and then here are your, your options, just a you know, crazy number of surgeries, radiation, chemo doesn't seem to be great for it, survival three to four months with cervical resection. I mean, I tend to see these dogs, like it's like less than two weeks. If, if they even leave the hospital, um, they're, they're, not, they're not living for a long time where they're not resectable. And so these are just examples of just like, just you know, radical surgeries you can perform, sure. Um, but uh, well, well, we'll talk more about it, it's just not commonly done. Pancreatic abscesses, um, I'm only mentioning this because I do find that it's very confusing the differentiate between neoplasia and abscess when it's really bad. So just thought I, I would talk about it, even though, again, in my experience with pancreatic disease, you know, your run-of-the-mill pancreatitis is way more common, and I also tend not to see these for surgery anyway. I think they're either being medically managed or they're, or they're euthanized, they're really bad before they get to me. So uh, pancreatitis that is unresponsive to medical therapies, they tend to be sterile. So these are, these are not septic uh, procedures here. Surgical debridement and open abdominal drainage is a possibility, I guess. Um, but mainly, what I tend to find is when I go in there, is it's got a perforated dog uh, has a perforated duodenum, and that's what's causing the secondary pancreatitis and pancreatic abscess. So it's not even the pancreas that's the issue. When you go in, you find out, oh man, it's a perf duodenum. Is it from um, a combination of steroid and NSAID usage, or did they overdose on NSAIDs, or um, was it a foreign body that passed through, or is it neoplasia that's eroded through? But um, maybe, maybe there's more to the story you have to investigate further. And it's really hard to, to investigate the cranial flexure of the duodenum as it comes down and becomes descending duodenum with a pancreas that's a mess, just adhere to everything. Common themes with this, uh, with this talk. You want to assess bile duct case patency, so you can either uh, put some gentle pressure on the gallbladder or you can try and pass a, a, a bile duct catheter. Um, this is typically done uh, through an enterotomy in the, in the uh, cranial descending duodenum to enter the papilla. And uh, usually I'm using um, uh, Tomcat uh, 
catheter if it's really tough. Otherwise, a very small red rubber tube to, to go up there and see if you can if you can declare pain. You're not going to open the gallbladder and then and then you pass tube that way. It's the, it's, you're going you're to go through the duodenum. And then, of course, you know what are your what are your surgical options from there? You know, are you going to reroute the gallbladder with a collate cystic endurostomy? So this is either a jejunostomy or a duodenostomy. Usually, duodenostomy. Um, uh, it's more physiologic, but jejunostomy is more accessible. Depends. Um, are you going to remove a portion of the pancreas that's disease? And then, um, you know, are you going to add in neuromentalization or, um, or uh, and or open perineal drainage? I don't know. I mean, maybe I guess but these are a mess. I mean, these are just these are just. Uh, they're not great. Uh, Post-operative care is, is a nightmare, and the patient's just the, the quality of life uh, ends up being an issue with them. If they even leave the hospital, I mean, is there, is there not, these, os, these dogs aren't even leaving the facility, so that's, that's, the, that's the problem with it. We'll dive into some surgical procedures. Um, pancreatic biopsy. Um, do you folks uh, biopsy the pancreas in surgery, like exploratory? No? Um, there's no need to, or is it like a... Yeah, yeah. If I go in for like the negative uh, abdominal exploratory for a foreign body ends up being negative, then I I will biopsy the pancreas amongst you know the plus liver, stomach, small intestine, lymph node if it's obvious. Um, so that's my usually when I'll biopsy or or if it's exploratory for any other reason, and I do find that there's pancreatic lesions, and I'll biopsy them. And um, I don't know about multiple biopsies. I mean, I tend to biopsy just one region. You use the right limb, the pancreas. Right at the very edge, where where it uh, it ends uh, um, uh, caudally on the duodenum, um, there's usually enough of a small dimple of a, pa of a pancreas that you can just clip off with either medicine bombs, no suture needed, or maybe one suture and then uh, and then lop it off that way. But I, I I really try not to put any suture in the pancreas anyway. I try just to find that one portion of, of pancreatic area that's sort of uh, popping out, and then I cut it with a medicine bomb, and that's it done, um, and then submit that. And if there's no obvious lesion. If there's an obvious lesion, of course, we're biopsying that. So usually the right pancreatic limb is, is, is accessible for biopsy. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, procedures that are, in, that are going to be in your nose that you can consider, but um, I'm, I'm more of a um, uh, mets and bomb, so just, I, just, I just cut it. And then here's just showing like a laparoscopic uh, uh, version of this as well. But here's someone who, who put um, some suture around the, the, the area of the pancreas they want to biopsy. So suture it, and then and then cut with a, with a blade. And here are the procedures that I've, I've never done these before. Um, so we'll just talk about them because they exist, but you know, uh, partial pancreatectomy. So if you're aiming for the right pancreas, then your goal is you know, duodenum, left pancreas, momentum, and you're trying to remove as much pancreas as possible. So if you have a, um, a lesion here in the, the pancreas, you're trying to be aggressive and, and collect not just a lesion, but also some level of, of margins, then you're removing the, the pancreas, uh, you know, and here you see them attaching the pancreas, um, the stomach here. It's, it's, I mean, I, I don't even, I just, this is all, this is in people, by the way. I, I don't know anyone who does this in dogs, but the reports of it. I just don't know, I just couldn't find any pictures of animals with this. So, um, anyway, a variety of measures to do it. And apparently, you can remove a large portion of the pancreas. Within six weeks post op, the pancreas will increase to 50% above original weight. That's crazy. Um, I'm assuming that these are also, um, it's probably safe to assume, these are all experimental healthy dogs without any disease, I presume. Um, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, just wanted to expose you to this, that's all. And then there's, there's the total pancreatectomy, so in cases of severe trauma, intractable pancreatitis, um, and then of course you end up with a dog that's got diabetes, EPI, you know, duodenal cyanosis is a problem because it's, it shares the same vasculature as the pancreas, but you're basically removing the, the, the pancreatic limb, left pancreatic limb, spleen goes with it, you gotta ligate all the, all the vessels, then you chase the right pancreatic limb, um, leave the duodenum vessels intact, and then you, uh, you uh, transect at the uh, pancreatic ducts, and out with the pancreas, you know, so I don't know. And then the craziest thing, and I saw a video of them uh, in, in people doing this laparoscopically, that I, just, I can't even, I just can't even fathom this. Uh, anyway, Whipple's procedure, um, a total pancreatectomy uh, with rerouting, I mean, look at this, with rerouting the, the, the stomach and the intestines. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, let's see, one noble supply preservation is not possible. So the gastric pylorus and duodenum is excised at the level of the distal end of the right pancreatic limb. 
then you reroute the pancreas, so pancreatic goes duodenectomy, oh, sorry, remove the pancreas and duodenum, and then bile duct is ligated, and then you have to reroute the gallbladder, and then reroute the stomach and intestine. I, you know, I don't know, yeah, this is, and, and they do it laparoscopically in people, I just, I can't, feel, I just can't even comprehend this, but um, you end up with some sort of a mess like this. Anyway, key points, um, pancreatic function is made up of both endocrine and exocrine, uh, uh, pancreatitis, is you know far more common than these neoplastic diseases. So the point of that line was you know um, try to err maybe on the side of caution. Perhaps you can just treat this aggressively with pancreatitis. Maybe uh, I don't know, but um, it tend, it is more common than neo neoplasia of the pancreas. So um, I've, I've you know I've had uh, dogs euthanized on the table um, by surgeons where I'm like you know maybe maybe just biopsy, wake up and just treat medically aggressively with pancreatitis and wait for the biopsy to come back and see you know or um, you know it's tough with these cases to tell. But you know, obviously, it comes down to client communication and your own experiences. Um, pancreatic biopsies, you know, they're good if, if you feel comfortable. Um, the best place to start with these is you know, a routine abdominal explore where there's no foreign body found, and just the right limb of the pancreas towards the distal end by the by the duodenum. Um, I always biopsy the liver and lymph nodes, especially if I'm looking either at abdominal exploratory or if I'm worried about pancreatic cancer. And then there's uh, lots of different options, none of which are great. Um, medical management might be ideal for these cases, but uh, you know, dealer's choice. My contact information. Any uh, any questions at all? Yes. Do you palpate them? Because that's how I found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm always nervous about palpating the pancreas for obvious reasons. Um, but if you're convinced, that, is it for insulinoma, I assume, right? So for, if you're convinced it's insulinoma, you have the blood work to prove it, maybe even ultrasound or CT identifying it, yeah, 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 gently palpate and see if you can feel that, that like, it is there. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you show the ones that don't have the pancreas that do you, a, a colleague of mine said that in ferret they offer one of these and mm -hmm. they use sterile Q-tips. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you do that? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sterile Q-tips so are. Either way? Yeah, Q-tips are great for, for pancreas. Okay. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I've done it in a dog, I've done it in a ferret. Yeah. So in a dog, I see. Yep, we, yeah. We, I, I use sterile Q-tips for that as, as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll also, if you're trying to suture and the suture isn't holding, um, you can also try, I've done it where I just place momentum over it, yeah. and yeah. Right, let it sit there, wait for it to kind of adhere, and then gently close the abdomen and you know, try not to rock the boat. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's momentum on there, and that's it. I, I haven't used gel foam on the pancreas, has anybody? Yeah, I don't know if I would do that. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was worried about causing an inflammatory response, and then, um, um, sometimes the, the body doesn't react anyway well in general to the, the gel foam. I mean, at least with liver, there's so much liver there, it's just a larger organ. And um, I'm gonna miss a lot of these gel foams just fall off the liver anyway once, you know, once they, yeah, just for a little bit. So when you're using the Q-tips and dumping them in the dog, mm -hmm. it, are you just like kind of like mushing the mm -hmm. normal pancreas off? Yep. Because yep. it's gonna like look mushy. Yeah, yeah. You, I wet the tips of the, of the Q-tips in sterile saline and then, and then gently, gently work it. Yeah, yeah, because you know, um, it's it, to me again in my mind. I don't have any any um, papers, any literature on margins for these. So how, yeah, so how much normal pancreas do you need to include when you remove the insulinoma? So I'm really just trying to hug it yeah, and yeah. just and just get it out, and hopefully that's so the. So if you can, if it's towards the end, the distal end, the right thing, do you try to do a partial? Yeah. Because it looked like the survival times were better. Yes. All the the whole Q-tip and, and manipulation uh, is assuming that the nodule is either like in the pancreatic body or like on the limbs, but not on the extremities. Yeah, if you had the chance to nucleate it, a absolutely. It's just usually they're just like mid-body, kind of like just sitting there, and and you have to just sort of dissect, get in there, shell it out, and then and then and go. But yeah, if you have the opportunity to remove it, I. I wouldn't remove pancreas to the point where the dog is gonna have EPI or diabetes, you know, and I don't wanna have severe pancreatitis afterwards either, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Any other questions or experiences with, the, with, with this stuff? Thank you very much, thank you. Can I ask you another question that has yeah. to do with pancreas? Oh, definitely. Um,
Mm -hmm. said, oh, make sure you don't go too close to the okay, gastric vessel. You know, you could cause it. She goes, that's been debunked. And I'm like, has it? I'm like, so out of school for so long. Has it so, been? Like, so, do you have to worry? I, so I, I've, I've always um, hugged the spleen yeah, when I'm, too. right, because I, why, why, why otherwise? I mean, if, if, you, if you're dealing with a benign splenic tumor, then surgery is curative regardless of margins. Right. If it's malignant, I mean, are you really going to add to the survival time with a hemangiosarcoma? Have if, you seen if you're, the gastroperitis awareness? I, I haven't. So but, it's been reported, but not really something that's too urgent. Yeah. But still set up. Okay. Yeah, I would just hug the spleen. I don't, I don't see any reason to, to go towards the stomach re regardless. Um, and then also, I wonder also too, like with, with GDVs, for example, where all the gastric you know, vessels are ruptured, I mean, w you know, if there's no gastric necrosis at the time of the GDV, I don't expect them to have it later because those vessels were ruptured. So, um, but no, I would just hug the spleen anyway. I don't know about, I don't know about debunked. I mean, I, I don't guess I haven't. I have to ask her, I think she was at another conference and was in a lecture for Splenic yeah. Medicine, whoever that was. I would just hug the spleen. I mean, it's just, there's, no, yeah. there's no point anyway to get more aggressive than yeah, that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna sell it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs>